Hi everybody, and welcome to Tea with Jesus for this week. I was just chuckling because every time that Bill tried to turn the camera on to get me started, Leo was rubbing up against him and bumping his arm. <laughs> He's really soaking up the loving right now. There is a city way back in the um, New Testament times that was quite ancient, even at that time, and it was called Jericho. And um, Jericho had um, gone way back. I mean, remember way back when the children of Israel in the Old Testament uh, went around the city and the walls of Jericho came down? Well, this is a very ancient city. It's about five miles west of the Jordan, and about the Jordan River, and about 15 miles northwest of Jerusalem. Now, during the time of Jesus, the time that you know, Luke was writing about here, um, the Old Testament Jericho was abandoned, basically. But a new city south of the old one had been built by Herod the Great. And so um, Jericho was actually an absolute hub of, uh, of trade. Um, it was a major custom site for goods that were entering Israel from the east into the city of Jericho. Well, in Jericho, there lived a short Jewish man who had actually become head over a group of tax collectors. He was considered a chief tax collector. And um, because a lot of money came through Jericho, a lot of things came through, and it was a fairly well-to-do area there, um, he had become pretty wealthy. And um, the, the people got really angry because a lot of times they really felt like that not only were these Jewish tax collectors um, siding with the Romans when the Romans actually had them all under oppression, but a lot of times the collectors um, took more money than they should have and kept it for themselves. And so there's this man living there, um, kind of living high on the hog in um, Jericho. And he had been hearing about this man named Jesus. And there must have been something about either what he had heard or maybe a chance when he had actually heard Jesus speak or seen Jesus perform a miracle, perform a miracle or heard what Jesus was talking about um, that grabbed at him. He just, well, actually, I think if I really think about this story, um, I don't know how much he'd really been able to see Jesus, but he was drawn to him. And I really believe that in his heart, he knew very well that he had been wrong, and he just felt drawn to Jesus. Well, this man's name was Zacchaeus, and we're going to talk about his story with Jesus today. I'm going to read Luke 19, 1 through 10. Jesus entered Jericho. Now remember, there would have been like the old part of the city, and then there was the newer that was farther south. Um, some of the Gospels say as he was leaving, and some say as he was entering, and it may be whether they were referring to the old part of the town or the new part of, of the city. But anyway, Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. There was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region and he had become very rich. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass that way. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus. He opened the tree. He looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. He's gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor Lord. And if I've cheated people on their taxes, I'll give them back four times as much. Jesus responded, Salvation has come to this home today. For this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. 
And that's the story in Luke about Jesus' encounter with Zacchaeus and his family. Now we have to realize what an intensely disliked man that Zacchaeus was in his community. He would have been, like they said, notorious. Um, he was not only a tax collector, he was a chief tax collector over other tax collectors. And so he was a social outcast because people did not want to associate with someone who was helping Rome. And he was a religious outcast because people were just so angry at what he was doing. And so, um, you know, he was viewed as someone who was cooperating with the Romans um, and the people were so unhappy with the Roman rule over their lives. So he would have been quite, quite disliked and certainly not treated as an honorable Jew. That is for sure. And so he hears that Jesus is coming. And, you know, I said before I wondered if he'd ever seen him, but I kind of think that this was his first time getting to actually see Jesus. But, boy, he wanted to. These types of trees, it's actually literally a fig mulberry. And, by the way, regular sycamores are one of my favorite kind of trees. I think they're gorgeous. Anyway, um, but this was like a, literally a fig mulberry. But it's a sturdy wide open tree with low limbs and so it's pretty easy to climb so he climbs up in a tree so he can see Jesus because he just couldn't see over the heads of the crowd and Jesus looked up as he was going by and you know of course God was just showing Jesus things like crazy and um and the Holy Spirit was speaking to Jesus and you can imagine what that must have been like for Zacchaeus to hear Jesus go Zacchaeus and call him by name come down Come down quick. I must stay at your house today. It just fills Zacchaeus with joy. Like I said, I just think he was incredibly drawn to Jesus. And um, he took him home with him. And the people around were just like appalled that Jesus, who could have gone to any of the, the godly Pharisees' homes or any of the good people, would go to the home of one of the most hated men in the entire area. Um, they were grumbling, really grumbling about it. Now, um, there's several things that Jesus does here that I think were really, really touching. Um, because the people were really extremely, um, you know, angry and upset with Zacchaeus. And Jesus calls him a true son of Abraham. And that was just saying that with what he saw in the change in Zacchaeus' life and how humble he had become. And I'm going to talk a little bit pretty soon here about how much Zacchaeus actually gave back. But Jesus said, you have shown yourself in your reaction to me, to Jesus, and in what you're doing and what you want to do today. You're showing yourself to be a true son of Abraham. And... um Jesus was being, was honoring Zacchaeus. And I think that those words from Jesus must have been incredible for Zacchaeus to take away the shame of having earned the title of being much less than a true Jew, much less than a true son of Abraham. Jesus is saying, no, I look into your life and heart, and you are a true son of Abraham. And, of course, Abraham's entire relationship with the Lord um, all that God had promised him was really leading toward this incredible birth of Jesus, born into the Jewish nation to be the Savior and the King of Kings. And so um, Jesus really honored Zacchaeus as he said, yep, what you're doing now is, is showing yourself to be a genuine, genuine Jew. And um, I think that really meant an awful lot to Zacchaeus. So if we look in verse 8, Zacchaeus said that I'm going to give half my wealth to the poor Lord. If I've cheated people on their taxes, I'm going to give them back four times as much. Now, just last week, we heard about a rich young man that really wanted eternal life. He wanted the kingdom of God. But he could not part with his wealth. He could not part with the security that it gave him and the status it gave him. He couldn't trust Jesus, trust Father God enough to say, yes, I'll let that go 
and I'll follow you, and I know I'll be okay. Zacchaeus here had been so hungry for Jesus that he found a tree to climb in just to get to see him. And when Jesus honored him and his family with his presence, and Zacchaeus' heart was changed, he went above and beyond in saying, I'm going to lay aside these riches. They don't, they don't mean anything to me compared to pleasing you, Jesus, and honoring you. And so he was going to be giving half of all he had to the poor, and then people that he cheated, which apparently he had, he'll give them back four times as much. Now, he technically didn't have to do this much. I want to take a second and look in Leviticus 6, 1 through 5. Then the Lord said to Moses, Suppose one of you sins against your associate and is unfaithful to the Lord. Suppose you cheat in a deal involving a security deposit, or you steal or commit fraud, or if you find lost property and lie about it, or you lie while swear, swearing to tell the truth, or you commit any other such sin. If you have sinned in any of these ways, you are guilty. You must give back whatever you stole, or the money you took by extortion, or the security deposit, or the lost property you found, or anything obtained by swearing falsely. You must make restitution by paying the full price plus an additional 20% to the person you have harmed. And on the same day, you must present a guilt offering. So you had to return everything you had taken and then give 20% above that. Let's take one more mo moment here and look in Numbers 5, 5 through 7. Then the Lord said to Moses, Give the following instructions to the people of Israel. If any of the people, men or women, betray the Lord by doing wrong to another person, they are guilty. They must confess their sin and make full restitution for what they've done, adding an additional 20% and returning it to the person who was wronged. So he technically could have um, fulfilled the law by returning to the people what he had cheated them of and giving them 20% above it. But he... He realizes the depth of his sin. And God has brought into his life a caring for people through Jesus that maybe just really hadn't been there before. He cared about them. He wanted to give half of what he had to the poor, and he wasn't going to give 20% above what he had taken. He wanted to give them back four times what he had taken. So instead of them being returned 120%, he wanted to return back to them 400% of what he had stolen from them. And he was so changed by this encounter with Jesus. And then if we look in verse 10, Jesus said, For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. And, you know, that was really not what the people were expecting from Jesus. That kind of went against their political aspirations for the Messiah. He was supposed to come and set up a kingdom, free them from Rome, and Jesus kept trying to tell people, I have come to seek and to save those who are lost. Now, I want to really talk about something here. If we look at, oh, for instance, Jesus... Uh, told Zacchaeus um, in verse 5, I must be a guest in your house today. And then later on, after Z Zacchaeus, his life had turned around and his entire household was blessed by the pr presence of Jesus, Jesus said in verse 9, this is Luke, 10, Luke 19, 9, Jesus said, Salvation has come to this home today. For this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. And then he went on to say, for the Son of Man himself came to seek and save those who are lost. And so salvation came that day to that household. And I really want to talk a little bit about um, the fact that when Jesus brings salvation, um, it is a threefold thing in a person's life. And that the salvation that he brought to anyone that we read about here or that we know in our own lives is immediate and present and it's also for the future. And it deals with the past. So um, it says in Luke 1, 77, this is the, the song of praise that Zechariah sang when he was able to start speaking again. 
um, after John the Baptist had been born. Zechariah was his father. He says, he's talking about his son John, who was, came ahead of Jesus to tell the, pave the way for Jesus. He said, you will tell his people how to find salvation through forgiveness of their sins. So they would find salvation at that time. Um, let's go to 2 Corinthians 1. I'm going to do 2 Corinthians 1, 6. Paul is writing to the church in Corinth here. And he says, even when we are weighted down with troubles, it is for your comfort and salvation. For when we ourselves are comforted, we will certainly comfort you. Then you can patiently endure the same things we suffer. Uh, so I'm going to go on to seven because it's beautiful. We are confident that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in the comfort God gives us. So the comfort of God is present salvation in their lives. I'm going to go to two, Second Corinthians 7, verse 10. For the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience leads us away from sin and results in salvation. There's no regret for that kind of sorrow. But worldly sorrow, which lacks repentance, results in spiritual death. Very powerful scripture. But that is salvation working currently in someone's life. I want to go through just a few more scriptures about salvation working now in our lives after we have given Jesus the chance to save us when we have asked him to be our Lord and Savior and invited him into our life. This is Romans 6, verse 4, Paul's letter to the church in Rome. For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. Just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Current salvation. Romans 12, 2. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. That's wonderful. That's God bringing about change in our life, his salvation in our life now. Okay, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. I love that. And Galatians 6, 15. It doesn't matter whether we've been circumcised or not. What counts is whether we have been transformed into a new creation. And then in verse 16, may God's peace and mercy be upon all who live by this principle. They are the new people of God. So there's so many scriptures that talk about how that salvation is something that begins in our life in the present. And it began in Zacchaeus' life and his family's life. That day, that day that Jesus was there and, and his love and his power changed their hearts and transformed this man who cheated people and robbed people into someone who was willing to give everything he could think of to try to help people and to make up for what he had done. But, you know, salvation is also wonderfully and gloriously for the future. And that's also wonderful to know. Now this is once again in Romans, Paul's letter to the church in Rome. And we're going to be reading Romans 13, 11, and 12. Now remember, now you know, uh, Paul is writing to the people in Rome about the fact that their salvation, and I mean their future eternity with Jesus, is going to come. His return is going to come. This is all the more urgent, for you know how late it is. Time is running out. Wake up, for our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The light, the night is almost gone. The day of salvation will soon be here. So remove your dark deeds like dirty clothes and put on the shining armor of right living. And just talking about that the salvation is coming also. And now in 1 Thessalonians 5, it'll be 8 through 11. Um, this is in a letter now that Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica. And this will be 8 through 11. But let us who live in the light be clear-headed, protected by the armor of faith and love, and wearing as our helmet the confidence of our salvation. For God chose to save us through our Lord Jesus Christ, not to pour out his anger on us. Christ died for us so that whether we are dead or alive when he returns, we can live with him forever. 
So encourage each other and build each other up just as you are already doing. And so this is talking about that the Lord will take us home to be with him, whether it's because we've died here or if we're still alive here when he comes and gathers his church up, um, we'll be able to be with him in eternity. So this salvation is for now and it's for the future. So one of the things I want us to really understand is that salvation has a real threefold meaning. And it's really good to grasp this. Um, I'm going to use three big words, <laughs> but they're wonderful words, and it's wonderful what they mean. I'm going to use justification, sanctification, and glorification. Now, our past, because of the salvation of Jesus Christ, we now have justification, justification for our past, for all the sins we have ever committed. Justifying something means it's just as if it hadn't happened. It's just as if I hadn't sinned. My sins were nailed up on that cross with Jesus. I am forgiven. The price has been paid. He doesn't hold that against me anymore. Oh my goodness. So our past is just, it has justification. It's justified. Our present, we have sanctification. A ch changes that come about in our life as the Holy Spirit gives us strength and understanding of, of who we need to become. And through His power and His presence in our life, we can become more and more like Jesus. More and more like the fruit of the Spirit with love, joy, peace, patience, long-suffering, self-control, all of it. It's, it's something that's happening in our life. To sanctify something is to set it apart for God's purpose, to set it apart for holiness, for God's purpose. So we are being changed in the present and sanctified. And then in the future, in being with Christ and being in His glory and being a part of Him up there, a part of His family, we will have glorification. We will be able to be glorified um, in the incredible shining glory that's Jesus. So we have the past justified, the present sanctified, and the future glorified. So when we think about evil and sin, when we think about the presence of that in our lives now and how frustrating it is and sometimes hard to deal with, just remember that salvation brings freedom from sin. In the past, we are now free of the penalty of sin. We will no longer have to have the penalty. We have God's mercy we're not going to receive what we have earned, which is not good, because of our sin. Our sins are forgiven. So the penalty for all we've ever done and really for all we're going to do in Jesus um, is forgiven. So we are free from the penalty of sin in the past. In the present, we can be free from the power of sin over our life. With the with just reaching out to the Holy Spirit, reaching out to the Lord, praying, being honest with Him, giving Him time, step by step, we will have less and less um, desire or, um, you know, tendency <laughs> to do things that we know are really wrong. We're going to want more and more to please Him. And we're going to have more and more strength to be able to do that. So in the present, we can be free of the power of sin. And oh my goodness, oh, in the future, in that glorious time when we are with Him, either after our death or after the church is taken up to be with Jesus, we will be free of the presence of sin. It just isn't going to be around anymore. Evil won't be around and sin just won't be there anymore. So through Christ's salvation, our past is free to the penalty of sin. Our present is free to the power of sin. And our future is free of the presence of sin. I think that is so... <clears throat> So wonderful. So as I look here at this wonderful story of this man who was willing to try to climb a tree and maybe be even ridiculed for it. I'm sure he probably was. He wasn't like that much anyway. Um, this man who wanted to see Jesus so badly and he and his entire family's lives were changed that day and changed for their current time and changed for their eternity. And Jesus loved him and loved his family and wanted so much to find, to seek to save those who were lost. And I believe Zacchaeus was gloriously saved. Let's pray. Lord, I think most of all, 
I want to thank you for how that you took care of a horrible problem that we have, that we are such sinners, and knowing that we couldn't help ourselves. You gave so much so that we don't have to be destroyed by sin in our life. Lord, I pray that we're going to recognize when the enemy is trying to deceive us. I pray, Lord, that we're going to hear your voice clearly through your word or just as you speak into our life and to our heart. As you give words to us from others, Lord, help us to hear your voice and to know you more all the time. And thank you that we do not have to live under the penalty or the power of sin, of evil, and that we know that we're going to be in a place someday that's not like this world, Lord. It's going to be free of sin. And just the, the joy of that, Lord, is amazing. So, Lord, I pray that I, I really want um, my own human inadequacies to please just get out of the way of your truth. And I pray that your word is going to really speak into um, into our hearts, into all of our hearts that are listening. And Lord, I pray that we can reach out and be a light to others all around us. And so Lord, continue to bring forgiveness, reconciliation, and healing in families that are hurting so much. Lord, I pray that people that are sick can know your presence and they can know your power and your healing in their lives and that you love them and care for them and you never leave them. And Lord, I pray for so many that reach out that are lonely. God, bring people into their lives that are right there with arms to hug them and hands to help them. And Lord, I just pray that whatever the needs are here, Lord, for, for vehicles, for jobs, for provision, for homes, for so many things, God, I trust you as our great provider. And Lord, I thank you and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. I will see you guys next week. And um, thanks for coming along with me when we learned about this amazing story about Zacchaeus. All right, I love you. See you soon.